right, well, we will get started. So hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us, <clears throat> excuse me, for today's CAS webinar on detecting, investigating, and prosecuting student disciplinary matters in the age of the coronavirus, presented by our guest attorney, Michael McKeon from the law firm of Pullman and Cumley. I'm Bill Silva, Associate Executive Director at the Connecticut Association of Schools. And I'm pleased to have so many signing on for this very timely presentation. Before I introduce Attorney McKeon, I want to thank our corporate partners, the Connecticut Army National Guard, Liberty Bank, Horace Mann, Jostens, and of course, Pullman and Cumley for their ongoing support of CAS's high quality professional development for school leaders and all educators in Connecticut. I also want to go over how we will proceed this morning. During the presentation, you and the audience are muted, but you may share and I encourage you to share any questions you have using the Q&A feature. And our presenter will try to answer as many questions as he can um, uh, after his presentation uh, this morning. We are also recording the webinar and uh, we will make that recording available to you in the next few days. Uh, and now let me introduce our distinguished presenter. Attorney Michael McKeon is a member of the school law section of Pullman and Cumley's Labor, Employment Law and Employee Benefits Department. Attorney McKeon represents boards of education and other clients in both federal and state courts at the trial and appellate levels, as well as before federal and state boards and commissions. Attorney McKeon has presented on a variety of education law issues, including special education law, gender equality in student athletics, and both gender and disability-based student harassment. And he regularly conducts training for school personnel on sexual harassment and education law issues. Attorney McKeon has served as adjunct professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law and in the University of Bridgeport's Department of Education doctoral program. A graduate of the University of New Hampshire and University of Missouri, Attorney McKeon received his law degree from the University of Connecticut School of Law. Well, welcome, Attorney McKeon. We're so pleased to have you here with us this morning. Uh, we look forward to the information that you have to share. And I will now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you for that introduction. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, this is uh, a, a topic which, I mean, student discipline, I mean, I've represented school districts for, oh my God, I'm gonna date myself, probably about, I don't know, about 28, 30 years. Um, needless to say, you know, I must have started when I was a teenager, but um, the, uh, and, and to the, you know, I've done countless student disciplinary proceedings, either the hearing officer or procedural advisor sitting with the Board of Education or prosecuting the cases for administrators. Um, and so this, this presentation, there's a lot of background to it. Um, because, you know, frankly, in my day-to-day -day work and counseling of school districts, I find that there's still a lot of misconception, there's still a lot of misunderstandings as to the components of student discipline. And then, you know, I, I also, so I talk about what it all entails into the law, as well as getting into like uh, off-campus conduct, social media, search of the electronic devices. Also, some of the issues that have arisen now in the uh, era of the coronavirus. My understanding that Bill is, is kindly going to uh, uh, keep track of the questions. Uh, I was an English major, so my, my technical know-how, technological know-how is somewhat limited. But if you do have questions, please feel free to ask them. Um, also, this is a fairly lengthy PowerPoint. Uh, despite that, I, I could have made it twice as long if I covered each and every topic, but uh, I didn't want to totally glaze your eyes. So. Um, Let's just, let's just get started. You know, and some of you probably know this, at least in general, but Connecticut law provides both for the suspension of students and for their expulsion. And suspension is something that is typically vested in administrators, uh, typically building administrators. Um, and one can be suspended or it can suspend a student, hopefully the administrator's not suspending himself or herself, uh, if student engaged in conduct on school grounds or school school sponsored activity, that could be the prom, that could be an athletic event, uh, that sort of thing, that violates a publicized board policy or is disruptive of the educational process. Um, they can also suspend students for off-campus 
misconduct, but it has to violate a board policy and be seriously disruptive. So if it happens on school grounds, it can be a violation of board policy or it could simply be disruptive. Quite frankly, I've never really understood that distinction. If it's seriously disruptive of the educational process, it almost undoubtedly is violating a publicized board policy. If that's not the case, then you should really review your board policies because they need to be more comprehensive. Um, and for off campus, though, you have to have both, both the violation of the board policy and be di seriously disruptive. And I'll talk a little bit later about what serious disruption entails. Uh, this is really kind of an interesting aspect of 10233C, which is of the Connecticut General Statutes, which addresses suspensions. Students may be suspended at any school year for up to 50 school days or up to 10 times, whichever is less. So in other words, as I say in here, you can have one student getting five 10-day suspensions. After that, on the 51st day, the student would be entitled, it would be essentially deemed an expulsion and the student would be entitled to have a formal hearing before the board before he got his 51st day of suspension. At the same time, you could have a student who's getting 10 one-day suspensions. And even though that student would have only been suspended 10 days, because they've been suspended on 10 different occasions before they could be suspended on that 11th occasion, even again, if we're just gonna be for one day, because that would be the 11th suspension in any particular school year, they'd get a hearing before the board. So you really need to be judicious when you're suspending. And um, you know, in other words, you know, use your suspensions wisely. Uh, you do a series of these one day suspensions, like I said, suddenly you're gonna run out of suspension uh, rope, so to speak, and you're going to have to then move it before the board, which that really gets you know far more involved. Uh, one thing that that is kind of a still people are not completely clear on is how do the steel how do suspensions uh, work with special ed and five hundred four students? They are subject to the same suspension provisions, um, so. You districts are not re See, years ago when I was doing this originally. Once someone, let's say you had a special ed kid who got suspended for 10 days in October, and then in January they were coming up for another suspension, the districts would say, Well, my god, it's the 11th day of exclusion in a school year, even though it's not consecutive, it's cumulative. We have to have a manifestation determination. That, in fact, is not the case. Uh, you're not required to convene manifestation determination meetings prior to suspension, even subsequent suspensions, even if that means a kid is going to be, have been suspended for more than 10 days in a school year, unless the length, basis, and proximity of multiple suspensions constitute a pattern of removals. Now, that's kind of a subjective determination. But, I mean, if you get a kid who gets suspended every month, well, I think that's a pattern. And the kid's essentially getting a change in placement and you need to have a manifestation. But if he got, he or she got 10 days in October, got five days in January, that's not a pattern. Uh, and you do not have to have a manifestation determination. Meaning the, the Congress changed that because they wanted, they wanted to relieve some of the administrative burden of school districts. Um, structural obligations, kids are entitled to make up their work, uh, including tests. But during the first 10 days of suspension, you don't have to provide them with actual direct instruction. In other words, you don't have to provide them with tutoring. Um, and that also includes the special ed students. First 10 days of suspension in any school year, you don't have to provide direct instruction to a special ed student. Now, in this era of remote instruction or hybrid instruction, uh, where a lot of kids are, are opting for um, online uh, remote instruction, you know, I don't think it's going to kill the district to, to keep the kid getting remote instruction. I mean, unless, unless you're being totally punitive, um, which, yeah, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes totally punitive is, is, is a good thing. But um, you can, you know, in that, those situations, if you wish, you can provide the kid with the remote instruction. Mike, can I just interrupt yeah. for a second? And uh, there's two clarifying questions that come in that are probably good to address now. Okay. One asked, um, in talking about suspension, is in-school suspension consider, counted in the same way as yes. out-of-school suspension? It is. Okay. And then the other question, uh, when you were talking about 
the 50 days of suspension, does a hearing after the 50th day of suspension reset the clock for 50 more days? Uh, cool, that's a great question. I would say no, uh, just because the statute says maybe suspended for up to 50 school days. Before, well, that's a good question. It's before they have a 50 school days before they have a hearing. Um, I, I would think that, I don't think it does. And frankly, if, if you've got a kid who's getting suspended that much, there should probably be, that's a red flag and there should probably be a referral to a PPT uh, if there's that many uh, contact issues. Uh, I've been doing special ed for years, so maybe I'm erring on the side of special education, but either that or the kid had engaged in so much misconduct, perhaps you should be expelling a student for the rest of the school year uh, in one fell swoop. Uh, but no, I don't think it does. Thank you. Great, great question, though. Uh, both of them. Um, okay. So, uh, expungement, suspensions, goes on the kid's record, gets expunged upon the child's graduation. A district can decide to expunge prior to graduation, but only if it was the first suspension and that first suspension period was either shortened or waived. If those two criteria aren't met, that suspension has to stay on the kid's record until the student uh, graduates. Uh, must have an informal hearing. I, I, it, it's funny, they call it a hearing, but essentially the hearing is the student is accused of a suspendable conduct. You bring a student down to the office, the assistant principal or principal says, hey, Billy, so-and-so, you know, it's believe that you did such and such. Did you do it? No, I didn't do it. Okay, you're suspended. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's this kind of process where it's, it's due process and due process is a very flexible concept depending on the, the interest that's being protected and the, the context. Uh, in the, content, in the uh, circumstances of a suspension, it, it's very, what we, like to, what we like to say in the law, de minimis. Uh, very, very minimal. Um, but the student does have the right to have their story told. Now, if you've got a student who's working remotely and the student refuses, you know, you can do this informal hearing virtually, uh, but if this, you can even do it by telephone. But if the student refuses to cooperate, well, that doesn't mean you can't suspend the student. You just have to provide the opportunity for the student to give his or her high, uh, side, his or her side of the story. Student doesn't avail him or herself of it. That's on them, not on you. This sort of is interesting, the question that was asked before, because as you will see, Connecticut law now requires that all suspensions be in school. Uh, there are exceptions. And for purposes of time, I don't I didn't think that the, the, the exceptions are set forth here on the PowerPoint. So I don't know if I really need to go through them. But an administrator can make a determination that it's serious enough, there's enough of a danger that the in-school suspension should be out of school suspension. Um, that's for students in grade three through 12. For students preschool through second grade, uh, you can only suspend a student out of school if it involves violent or uh, sexual uh, misconduct that endangers persons, which seems kind of redundant. I think if it's violent or sexual misconduct, it's almost absolutely going to endanger persons. But nonetheless, uh, that's, that's legislative speak for you. Um, I think, you know, this sounds kind of snarky, but it's absolutely true. This ISS mandate that, you know, the kid be suspended in school instead of out of school is not the most deciduously followed provision of the law. Uh, kids are suspended out of school all the time. Um, there's a certain amount of flexibility built into this administrative determination. Um, so the law says one thing, but how it's applied, typically it's different. Mike, can now, I interrupt again with a sure, clarifying question? Uh, goes back to the requirement about providing instruction during a period of right. suspension. And the question is, does direct instruction only have to be provided after the 10th consecutive day or after the 10th cumulative day 
in a year? Great question. After the 10th cumulative day. Thank you. So the first the first 10 days are, are freebies. Um, of course, you know, one of the problems with that is, is and it's not so much a problem now because we have the remote instruction, is that most kids who are engaging in misconduct were not um, considerate enough to tell you when they were going to do it. So suddenly the kids facing the 11th, 12th, whatever day of suspension, you've got to get a tutor or something in place. And you're, suddenly the district is scrambling to do it. Uh, but in any event, uh, you know, now again, you can just kind of plug them into remote instruction. But uh, it is the 10th cumulative, cumulative day. The you know, COVID-19, what, what is the school day? What is in school? That, that whole concept, those concepts have changed. Obviously, you got a re fully remote uh, instructional model. The students' suspensions out of school. You, know, you don't bring the kid in so he can comply with the in-school suspension requirement. Furthermore, into the hybrid model, it, it, it doesn't make much sense to rotate a student in and out of school simply to serve a suspension. Um, I think, therefore, give the circumstances, uh, in those cases, in-school suspension would be served out of school. Uh, and, and one can almost argue that, well, actually, particularly if the kid is still participating in the remote instruction, the kid still is almost in school still. Even though they're not in the building, they're still participating in the school. So, um, yeah, you got to use common sense. You got a kid on a, on a, you're on a two day in, two day out, you know, or three day out, whatever model. It wouldn't make much sense. You'd bring the kid in for two days and you have him or her home for three days, just make it an out of school suspension. Um, expulsions, Connecticut, you can expel for up to one calendar year. Used to be 180 school days, but a lot of districts have more than 180 school days. So some years ago it was changed to one calendar year. Uh, you know, there are states in this country where school districts can expel a kid until the end of time. Uh, if it's sufficiently serious misconduct, they get expelled, they never come back. Now, social policy wise, yeah, maybe not the greatest idea, but as far as making a school safer, uh, life a little bit easier for uh, staff, not a bad thing. Uh, but again, uh, from a, from, for the greater good of society, perhaps not the best. Um, Suspensions, unlike suspension, only school boards can, uh, or a panel of the board or a hearing officer has the power to expel. If it's the board, if it's a panel of the board or the full board, there have to be, well, if it's a majority of the board, you have to have a majority of votes, obviously, to expel. But at the very least, if it's a panel of like, like three mem board members, four board members, you need at least three votes to expel. So if you have a three person hearing panel and two want to expel and one doesn't, the kid is, cannot be expelled, even though it's two to one, because you don't have three votes. Uh, let me give you a quick example. Some years ago, I was, I was hired to prosecute an expulsion hearing. And it was a kid who was accused of high school and was accused of sexually assaulting one of his classmates. So I put on the case, it's to a three member uh, panel of the board. Uh, they go to deliberate. Some time goes by, they come out, the board uh, attorney comes out, gets me and brings me out to the hall and says, hey, just wanna let you know, Mike, the board's gonna vote to expel, but the board chair is gonna recuse himself. I said, why? Well, because this kid, he beat up the board chair's son last week. So he feels he might have a conflict. I said, well, did he know that at the outset of the hearing? Well, yeah, but he wanted to hear what the case was all about. I said, well, you need three votes to expel. Now you're only going to have two board members. We, we, you can't expel the kid. Oh, geez. Uh, he said, I, I didn't even think of that. So how kosher was, I don't know. But we came back the next week and we, we put the hearing on again with a different panel. And this time we get the votes. But you do need at least three votes. Boards had a discretion to expel a student in grades three through 12. Now, a couple of things. Discretionary basis for expulsion, which is usually set forth in board policies. Uh, very often it's board policy 5114, but different districts have different policy numbering systems. Um, you can only expel a kid three through 12. Preschool through second grade, you cannot expel on discretionary grounds, kids that young. Um, 
Furthermore, the legislature in its infinite wisdom, uh, and I know here, or please know, they tweaked the statute. It used to be, you could be expel someone for a violation of a publicized board policy or for serious disruption of the educational process. Now, as with suspensions, it has to be both. So it has to be violating board policy and a serious disruption. Limits the authority of, of, of districts to expel. But again, in most cases, if you're violating a board policy, I think an argument can also be made that it's seriously disruptive. It can be a stretch in some cases, depending on the nature of the offense. So it might be a little bit harder sometimes to get rid of these kids who are, where the expulsion is kind of a little, the context a little marginal, but that's something that has to be kept in mind. Um, you can also for third through 12th grade, you can expel them for off school grounds misconduct. Uh, and this is where the statute talk, and this is true for suspension as well. What, con what constitutes serious disruption of the educational process for off campus behavior? Did it happen close to school? Did it involve other schools, gangs, violence, weapons, and whether alcohol was involved? Uh, weirdly, as I say, they noted the legislature referenced alcohol, but not drugs. But the legislature also said these are not exclusive criteria. So drugs also can be a basis for off-campus misconduct. Uh, mandatory expulsion, the, the legislature has set forth certain grounds for mandatory expulsions. This applies for kids from kindergarten through 12th grade. So now those, those uh, miscreants in kindergarten, first and second grade can also be subject to expulsion. Uh, of course, if you have uh, kindergartners in possession of a firearm or a deadly weapon, uh, that's, that's, that's a little unsettling. Uh, or you were in illegal possession of a firearm off school ground. Now they say an illegal possession because if a kid is a hunter and has a hunting license and everything, that's not an illegal possession. Um, and on or off school ground sold uh, or distributed a controlled substance. Okay. You're supposed to expel a kid for up to a year for a mandatory. This is so typical lawyer speak, and you know the legislature is made up of a lot of lawyers. They say you have to expel the kid for a year, but if you want to shorten it, you can. That uh, you know, so essentially the, the the advice is that you expel for a year, but you're not required to. Okay, these are some kind of common misconceptions in the context of mandatory expulsions, um, and these are the ones I've come across over the years on more than one occasion. Um, if someone, if a kid is found with a certain amount of drugs, the police automatically uh, charge them not just with possession, but with possession with intent to distribute. Uh, there's, there, it, it's just assumed, well, guy, that kid doesn't have that much drugs just for his or her own use, but they're going to distribute. Intent is not the same as actual distribution. Therefore, if someone is arrested and charged with possession with intent to distribute, it's a felony, but it is not a mandatory basis for expulsion. I've run across this multiple times. Um, also, I've had some cases where a district will say, well, we really can't move forward on the expulsion because the police haven't, you know, the case hasn't been adjudicated yet by the court. The kid has been accused, but he hasn't been convicted. Well, that's irrelevant. The evidentiary standard in criminal proceedings is much higher than it is for expulsion hearings. So you might not be able to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and also the court system takes forever to, uh, to work. Uh, administrative hearings like expulsions, it is like the lowest standard of uh, evidence, lowest standard of proof there is. So you can still go forward. You should not be waiting for the for the police to and the and the courts to do their do their work. Also, distribution of a controlled substance, and and I know this sounds pretty draconian, but it does not require the transmission of money or a large amount of the drug. You got a couple of kids smoking a blunt. One passes it to another kid. That's distribution, um, and that's a mandatory expulsion. Again, I know there are some board members and even some administrators say, eh, "Well, Mike, you're really being kind of a, a hard ass there," but that is distribution. Um, you know, if, if you just hey, let's, let's 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 face it, if you if you decide to say, "Well, you know, we're not, we're I, I don't I don't care what Mike said." 
um, we're, we're not going to mandate an expulsion for a kid who's just smoking some dope and pass, you know, the joint to another kid. It, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's going to really make a big stake. And it's not like parents are going to insist that you expel their kid. But just so you know that that does, in fact, constitute a mandatory basis for expulsion. Uh, the hearing itself, just kind of how it proceeds. The administration prosecutes the case. I like to use this criminal analogy, just because it kind of helps explain to parents sometimes, even though they might bristle at the criminal aspect of the analogy, the purpose is to understand the roles. Administration, prosecution, students, the defendant, the board is the jury. Uh, the board typically has a procedural advisor who's usually an attorney who kind of, he's like the judge. He or she is the judge. They kind of run the hearing, uh, make sure that it goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, if it's a hearing officer, the hearing officer is both judge and jury. Uh, it's sort of like the equivalent in, it's in court of a bench trial where you try a case to a judge and not to a jury. Uh, important points to remember, notice that the hearing, you've got to provide notice. It's got to be as, as um, informative as possible. Uh, it's a violation of a student's constitutional right to due process if they have no idea why they're being expelled uh, or when or where the expulsion is going to be. You have to tell them that they have the right to be represented by an attorney. Um, the notice must be provided no later than five business days prior to the hearing. Not five calendar days, five business days. So that's very important to uh, keep in mind. Parents can uh, postpone for up to one week in order to obtain legal representation. You know, very often you're gonna find yourself in a situation where the parent says, hey, I can't make that night, the night or that day you scheduled for the expulsion and we have a continuance. Uh, we typically take the position, I typically take the position that the administration will agree to that, but in consideration of that, the parents have to agree to voluntarily keep the kid out. Now, if the parents ask for that week to get legal representation and refuse to keep the kid out, I mean, I think you really could have pushed it. I think you'd have to let him back in, him or her back in. But very, I, I really never had that case. Parents have always essentially been so grateful for the additional time that will keep the kid out. Uh, and the last thing they want to do is, is further irritate administrators or the board. Although there are some parents who revel in doing that, but you know, most parents hopefully will not. Um, when determining the length of an expulsion, not whether the kid should be expelled, but what if, the, if they decide a kid is engaged in an expellable offense, what, how long the ex expulsion should be, what the alternative educational opportunity should be, the board is by statute entitled to consider the student's prior disciplinary misconduct that resulted in removal from class to suspension or expulsion. You know, there's some theory of statutory construction we, we lawyers like to use, which would stand for the proposition that because the statute expressly states that the board members can consider this, they can't consider anything else. Nonetheless, it's very, very, very common for board members to also consider the kid's attendance and his or her grades. Uh, the rationale is that, well, the board wants to know who is this kid? Was this a screw up? Was this kid, is this, you know, a, a good student, what have you? So it's understandable and one could argue that, well, it's, it's, it's helpful in determining an alternative educational opportunity and an education in the length of the expulsion. But one could argue that, well, hey, my kid's a bad student. My kid doesn't do well academically, so you're punishing him or her because of that and expelling them for a longer period of time. I've never had that come up, but that's always a possibility. Um, alternative educational opportunities, anyone younger than 16 must be offered an alternative educational opportunity. Again, this has become much easier now with remote instruction, quite frankly. Um, 16 to 18 years of old and is being expelled for the first time, also entitled to an alternative educational opportunity, but only if the student complies with certain conditions established by uh, the board. Um, if the student's being expelled for the second time and they're between the ages of 16 and 18, they do not have to be offered an alternative educational opportunity. It's important to keep in mind, however, and perhaps I was remiss not placing this in the 
prior slide about the notice contents, if you do plan on taking the position, if the administration is going to take the position that, hey, this kid's been expelled once before, we're not going to offer an alternative educational opportunity, that has to be in the hearing notice. If it's not in the hearing notice, you've got to offer the alternative educational opportunity. Uh, again, my guess is that, well, again, you have to make sure the parents are fully informed and the student. And I, my guess is that the legislature was thinking that, well, parents are thinking, holy smokes, my kid's not going to get any education. I'm going to have to pay to put him or her in a private school or a parochial school. Maybe they're going to come in and contest it a little harder. I, I don't know. But that's just something you got to give them a heads up. Uh, kids who are over the age of 18 are not entitled to an educa alternative educational opportunity. The one exception are SPED kids. Special education students are always entitled to an alternative educational opportunity, regardless of the offense, regardless of the age, regardless of the number of expulsions. They are always entitled to an alternative educational opportunity. Uh, expulsion can be expunged upon graduation. Uh, if, however, a ninth to 12th grader is being expelled for illegally possessing a firearm or deadly weapon, that is not that cannot be expunged from the student's record upon graduation. That is like the uh, scarlet letter that has to stay on that kid's record to the end of time. Um, furthermore, and one of these considerations that boards sometimes have to have, and when I raise this, again, I look like I'm being such a terrible human being, uh, but Let's say, say, you know what, eh, this kid, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to expunge that expulsion at the end of the expulsion period. There's joy and, you know, Mudville, everybody's happy, hot dog. Uh, and then the next year, the kid engages in, another, the kid, 17 years old, engages in another expellable offense. And you say, hey, hot dog, this is his second expulsion. We don't have to provide an alternative educational opportunity. We're going to save some money on this kid. Um, well, not so fast. Because you expunged the first expulsion, as a matter of law, that first expulsion never happened. Obviously it happened, but as a matter of law, it's a legal fiction, but it never happened. So now you've expunged it the first time, the second expulsion is deemed the first expulsion. So you have to provide the alternative educational opportunity. So, you know, maybe you don't mind doing that. And again, with remote instruction, but hopefully remote instruction is not gonna last forever. Um, keep, you should keep that in mind. Student withdraws from school following the issuance of the hearing notice. Board has to go forward with the hearing. Kind of quirky and weird, but that's what you got to do. Um, you may adopt the expulsion decision from another school district following a hearing. Uh, so someone moves from, let's say, Simsbury to West Hartford. They were expelled from Simsbury. They come into West Hartford. West Hartford has a hearing. Sole issue of which is, when, is the expellable offense in Simsbury, an expellable offense here. And if so, then they can adopt the prior district's expulsion. Uh, kid stays out of school pending that determination, although he or she is entitled to an alternative educational opportunity. They don't want the kid just sitting at home doing nothing. So that, um, so, okay, so this is kind of an interesting scenario. So, all right, let's say parents are divorced, kids living in Simsbury with the mother, He's about to get divorced. He's about to get expelled. The hearing notice goes out. He moves to West Hartford with his father. They enroll him in the West Hartford Public Schools. Because the hearing notice went out in Simsbury, the law says Simsbury has to go forward with the hearing. Once the expulsion is there, then theoretically, at least, I think more than theoretically, West Hartford could now retroactively adopt that expulsion and decide whether to, to impose it upon the kid, even though he's already enrolled in West Hartford Public Schools and he's already a student there. That's a pretty quirky circumstances, but not quite as unusual as you might think. Um, so that's one of the peculiarities of the law, where it's, again, you have a kid moving into town, he's already in your school, and you say, hey, wait a second, we just learned from Simsbury you were expelled, sorry, we're gonna we're gonna adopt the expulsion. We're gonna have a hearing to see whether we want to adopt the hearing. The decision here, you may be out again. Um, okay. As I think you all know, sped kid, special education, or five hundred four student cannot be expelled unless there's a manifestation determination first. 
if you expel a student without having a manifestation determination, uh, you will be violating federal law um, because you'll be deemed to be punishing the child for his or her disability. Uh, and you violate 504, that's a bad thing because that can also lead to individual liability as well as district liability. Um, so how do you determine misconduct? A student's admission of misconduct is in most cases, the best basis for, I love student admissions of misconduct. They're, they're beautiful things, especially if they're in writing, they are the gold standard, a written statement where a student is saying, yeah, I, I distributed the marijuana. Yeah, I was uh, did such and such. Uh, oh, baby, that that's the expulsion right there. Um, now, if a student refuses to make a written statement, but nonetheless admits it, it's really advisable to have more than one staff member there. It's hard as this is to believe. I, I had a hearing years ago where I was sitting with the board as a procedural advisor. And the kid admitted to the assistant principal at that high school that he had been in possession of drugs. And the assistant principal testified about that to the board at the hearing. And then the kid goes up and said, I never said that. I never said that at all. I never made admission. He's making it up. I never said that. So we, one of the board members says, well, the kid said he didn't do it. So how can we expel them? <laughs> well, you know, you've got your administrator and you've got a student. The student has every reason in the world to lie. The administrator has no reason to lie. I, you, I, I would like to think you'd have a certain amount of faith in the credibility of your administrator. So the, the board member grudgingly agreed, but it, let me tell you, it was grudging. So it might not always be practically, practically speaking, it might not always be impossible, but it, it is always helpful if you have more than one staff member available when a student is uh, making admissions. But if you can get, again, you can get it into writing, whew, beautiful. Um, Mike, can I, case, can I interrupt for a, yes. a second, just to go back? Uh, I think this question is relevant to where you were a minute ago uh, in terms of uh, a special education student. And the question yeah. is, if a manifestation hearing determines that the misbehavior is a manifestation of a child's disability, what should administrators do if the child commits the same offense later in the school year? Does that violation always have to be determined to be a manifestation of the disability making future suspensions impossible? No, I think you can still suspend a student. Uh, again, unless it's a series of suspensions which constitutes a pattern of removals. You can still suspend a student, you just can't expel them. And the difference is Ultimately, that an expulsion is more than 10 consecutive school days. Um, if you're looking at another expulsion, yes, you would have to do a manifestation determination again. Or if the kid has multiple suspensions, you might have to do another manifestation. But the fact that in one instance, it's, it's a manifestation does not necessarily preclude you from suspending in the future, even for the same offense. Uh, or you know, for other offenses. And I'm so glad you asked me that, that, that question because I don't wanna to get too far off track, but one of the things, but this really illustrates a very good point. What I try to make to, to special ed clients all the time, when you're doing a manifestation determination, you have to understand that you're making a determination for that misconduct, but that's gonna have reverberations. So if you have, you say, well, the student's possession or, or the student's um, inappropriate conduct here with a manifestation, well, it's going to be kind of hard to expel the kid for doing that, saying misconduct in the future. And you know what? Hey, maybe it is a manifestation of the student. I mean, again, you could still suspend. But as far as the expulsion goes, you know, maybe maybe it was right, maybe it wasn't a manifestation and then you've done the absolute right thing. But sometimes it gets very uncomfortable. You're in these manifestation meetings, parents are weeping, they're angry, and people are saying, you know what? Uh, and, and you have staff members who are very soft-hearted, which is to their credit, I'm not criticizing them in the slightest. Uh, it, it shows their humanity. And they say, well, you know, I think it could be a manifestation. 
The manifestation determination standard is a very high one. It really basically has to be caused by the disability. In other words, the kid only engaged in that conduct because of the disability. Um, so you've got to understand that, you know, maybe you're, you're doing a nice thing at that point, but that's also going to basically insulate the kid uh, for, against prior for, for subsequent expulsions as well for similar misconduct. Thank but, you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, I've also had cases where I've been told by the building administrator, well, one kid came to us and said that Janie did such and such, but Janie says she doesn't do it, didn't do it. So we can't go forward to an expulsion. And I say, well, why not? Well, because we only have a he said, she said kind of situation. That's irrelevant. It's a credibility determination. If you find the student who has made the accusation appears to be credible, and is willing to put that allegation in writing. And you know, the, the student's name is going to be redacted from the statement when it comes to a hearing. But if they're willing to make a credible written allegation against the other student, that's sufficient. The fact that it's only a one says X, one says Y, does not preclude an expulsion. Now, if the student comes forward and makes an allegation, you think, mm, you know, there's bad blood between the two of them or I don't really believe the student. Well, again, your administrators, you're making judgment calls. But the mere fact that it's just a one-on-one -on -one is not a sufficient basis for not going forward. Uh, school resource officer, obviously, and the policeman requires a warrant to conduct searches. A school district does not. Uh, Furthermore, school district does not require parent permission or parent's presence to search a student or a student's belongings. At the same time, a student is very young or a student has limited cognitive ability, let's say a student's intellectually disabled, the student uh, is uh, a very involved autistic student, something along those lines. You know, you may want to have a pre parent present. Um, it just, you know, it just it might be the right thing to do. Um, are you necessarily required to? No. But you know, sometimes um, to avoid potential blowback. Uh, you know, my child's so young, he's terrified. He's not going to see a therapist, you know, that kind of thing. Or my child didn't understand what you were doing because, you know, they're intellectually disabled. So, you know, now once the parent's there, they can't interfere. But sometimes it's not such a bad thing to have a parent present in those limited situations. Okay, so search and seizure, Fourth Amendment, uh, which, you know, prohibits against unreasonable searches and seizures, applies to the police and the government. State, Article 1, Section 7 of the Constitu Connecticut Constitution has similar, almost identical language uh, protecting against unreasonable searches and seizures. And sure, and, and in accordance with both federal and state law, outside of school search and seizures, and by that I mean police, law enforcement searches and seizures, they require probable cause. And that's sufficient information to warrant a prudent person's belief. Not even a reasonable person, but a prudent, which is a higher standard, prudent person's belief that you're going to find evidence of a crime. Schools aren't held to that standard. The thinking is that student safety, safety of the school, um, supersedes a student's right to privacy. So, Districts have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more leeway in conducting uh, searches. There are, it's, it's not unfettered though. It's not like you can say, what the hell, man, let's, let's go to town here. Uh, there are certain limitations that have been implemented by the United States Supreme Court. A search must be reasonable at its inception and it must be reasonable in its scope. Now, unfortunately with all the horrific school shootings we've had, what's reasonable? School officials have been given a little bit more latitude in that area. But um, now, if you have someone who comes to you and says, hey, uh, Johnny Smith is selling edibles, uh, or uh, Jane Doe uh, is, is selling her Ritalin to uh, other kids. Uh, yeah, I think it's in there. Yeah, she was, in just, she was just doing it earlier today. OK, well that search is going to be reasonable at its inception because you have just been advised by a credible source 
that the student that very day has been selling controlled substances. Um, so you could call the student down, search the student, search the student's backpack, the student's purse, the student's locker. Um, now, if this occurred during the school day, and the, and the student says, yeah, this just happened a couple of periods ago, searching the student's car, if the student had the car out in the parking lot and the student wouldn't have, been, have the right ability to go out to the car, that would probably be outside the scope of a reasonable search because the kid's been in school, so it must still be on the student. Now, you could argue the converse of that is that, well, that's where the student is keeping his or her supply. If it's like edibles or you know pot, what have you, is in the, in the car and they're bringing in just a certain amount at a time. So under that argument, then like a search of a car could be deemed reasonable. Mike, here's a, a question yeah. that's directly relevant. Um, it says, if the school personnel have reason to search a student's vehicle on campus, but the student and parent refuse to allow access, how do we proceed? Uh, and on the assumption that the police don't have enough, uh, that it wouldn't, you know, merit a police search. Um, well, you know, most school policy, most school discipline, great question. They are really good questions. But the, the most school policies provide that a student can be suspended or expelled for insubordination, for failure to follow reasonable directives of school staff. So if you have, you want to go out and say, hey, we've got information. We believe it's credible that you have drugs in your car or you have a weapon in your car. Well, if you have a weapon in the car or drug car, you could call the police. Uh, and let the police try to get a warrant. Um, or you could, if you want to do it on your own, you could say, fine, we're going to suspend you and possibly move to expulsion for failure to uh, uh, cooperate. That's perfect. That's perfectly justifiable. Um, and that might be enough pressure so that the student, um, you know, the student cooperates. Now, if it is something like a weapon, or something like a or drugs or controlled substances, something like that. Particularly if you have a school resource officer, I tell the school resource officer, let the school resource officer work his or her magic, uh, whether that be to, um, you know, again, they just have to have probable cause. So that might be sufficient probable cause for them uh, acting within the scope of law enforcement outside the scope of the school. It's not your issue anymore, it's the police. You've told the school resource officer, you're stepping back, the police are going to take it from there. And so they might uh, be able to go ahead and search the car. But from a student discipline uh, perspective, if they're not cooperating, you can just still suspend and possibly move to expulsion for failure to cooperate. Mm -hmm. You should make sure though that your disciplinary policies have that has that provision in there. I, I think almost all of them do, but it's very important. Uh, for just those situations. Um, Great okay, question. New Jersey Thank versus you. PLO, that's the famous case. Two female students smoking at school laboratory. Both uh, student denies she's been smoking. Principal sees students' purse and finds a pack of cigarettes and rolling papers, uh, substantial amount of money. Uh, so all sorts of strange and terrible things. Uh, works its way up to the US Supreme Court because the student sues. Court says search had been reasonable and there's no fourth amendment violation. So again, we come back to the two, two prong test. Is the search justified at its inception? Now, if you just say, hey, you know what? That Johnny Jones, that kid, he's always up to no good. I, I just, I'm just getting a bad vibe off him today. I, I don't like the way he looks. I don't like the way he looks today. I, I don't think that'd be, I don't think that'd be a justified search. Uh, but if someone comes and says to you, hey, uh, he's up to such and such, or if the kid is glassy eyed, you know, it seems kind of out of it, like under the influence, that would justify a search. Um, and it's a reasonably related in scope. You know, that's always, uh, again, those are the two prongs of the test that, that the Supreme Court came up with. And uh, so, uh, okay, let's see. I think electronic devices, that's where this really kind of comes into play a lot. Um, 
Let me give you a hypothetical. You got, you've got a teacher observed several students gathered around a cell phone and laughing. So one student comes to the administrator or the teacher and says, hey, you know what? They're, they're looking at a nude photos of, a, of another student. You know, one student sexted another student and, and you know, they're looking at that. The teacher confiscates the phone, brings it to the vice principal. The vice principal searches the phone and finds a text message containing an inappropriate photograph of a female student. Was the search legal? Well, yes, it was. Again, it was, the search was reasonable at its inception. They've been told by a credible source that there is inappropriate sexting materials on the phone. Uh, was it reasonable in its scope? Yeah, it's not, like the, it's not like the administrator was looking through each and every aspect of the kid's phone, but they were looking to see the text, to see these pictures. Um, totally reasonable. Mike, Very here's a, another yeah. search question, and that's a kind of a particular scenario. If prior to your search, you see the student put what you think is drugs or what you're looking for into the waistband of their pants, oh. can you ask them to take out what they put in their waistband? And then the person goes on to say there was a specific example where the student claimed what she was putting in her waistband was a tampon uh, and there was confusion. Could they ask her to you know, show them what she put in her pants and Ooh, in this situation I, says I, she was told that she couldn't. Well, you know what? That's a real, that's, that's interesting. Well, um, let me get, let me respond this way. Some years ago, I think it was in New Haven, there was a case in which elementary school, in which someone claimed that, a kid claimed that some money had been stolen. So the middle administration brought the kids from this particular classroom in there and basically did a strip search of these children. Uh, they subsequently lost their job, if memory serves me, as a result of this. Uh, while the search itself might have been reasonable, the idea of the search, the scope of it was way, I mean, I mean, there's small kids, there's money, you're making them strip search over a few bucks. Um, that, was a, that was deemed over the top. You've got a student here who's claiming what's tampon. Boy, that's that's really getting on the edge there because, you know, if it's just something in their waistband, you say you turn your waistband out. And what do you got there? I don't think that's too intrusive. If you're saying the person to reach into their underpants to get something, I think that part might be a little too intrusive. Um, now, let's change the scenario a little bit. You think someone has put a weapon, like a small fire handgun or something? Absolutely. That's different. That's a weapon. That's a, a clear and present danger. Uh, and that's a situation where I think a, an intrusive search like that would be appropriate. I, I would have a female staff member. Uh, I wouldn't have any male staff members there. But um, if it's drugs, I think that people might say drugs are a bad thing. Man, possession, distribution of drugs or sale of drugs is a mandatory expulsion. Um, but nonetheless, that might be getting, I mean, making a student reach into their underpants and or, or reveal what's in their underpants, that that, again, if it's just a waistband. I don't think that's intrusive, but if it's going beyond that, I think it would be too intrusive. Unless we're talking again about something that's a, a, a a present age or like a weapon. Um, and you know, unfortunately, these cases really are case by case determinations, which always sounds like a legal cop out. Sound like your lawyer is just kind of trying to wiggle out of a difficult situation, but, but that's just how it is. Uh, that's just it is. I mean, not one shoe does not fit all feet. Um, this is a follow up to your okay. cell phone search. Uh, what if you have justification to search a cell phone looking for a nude picture, but you find evidence of sale or distribution of drugs? So you find another crime. I think it's fine. It, well, let's go back to TLO. TLO in the purse. They're looking for cigarettes because they think the kids were smoking. Uh, kids claim they weren't smoking. They found money and materials relating to the distribution of drugs. 
uh, there was like letters and stuff or there's written material that indicated the student was distributing or selling drugs. And uh, the court said that was appropriate. So long as the search uh, is reasonable, you know, here's the sexting thing we're talking about, or you're looking for evidence of, of you know, new photos or what have you, inappropriate images. And um, in the course of that, without, you know, going far afield throughout the kid's entire phone, you find evidence as well that the kid is selling drugs. Absolutely, that's totally appropriate. That's fine. You can use that as a basis for um, discipline. Uh, Again, I want to digress here, but I, I always feel like I should give this warning. And most of you probably already know it, but maybe not. Um, I wouldn't have known it a few years ago. But if you're looking at a, through a student's electronic devices and you find what appears to be child pornography, and you're thinking, ooh, we're going to expel them. You know, this kid, this is an expellable offense. We're going to need this for evidence in the hearing. Do not copy, transmit, download the child pornography. If you do so, you have just committed a state and federal crime for which you can be prosecuted and incarcerated. Um, it is like Superman and kryptonite. You find something like that, it's despicable, it's awful, but you do not make a copy of it. Uh, you do not retain it. You subsequently can give testimony at a hearing as to what you discovered. That's sufficient evidence. Uh, yeah, I, I had the phone and there were images such as, this is the images I saw. That's all you need. You call the police, you tell your school resource officer, what have you, you let the police handle it. Do not make any copies or do anything with it or transfer it to your phone so you have evidence of it. Because again, if you do so, you have committed a, a, a very, very serious felony. So on that happy note, I will continue. Um, here's another search question. You get Joe. Joe's a real pain. You know, he's a pain in the neck. He's always being a jerk in class and so forth. He's insubordinate. He skips classes, gets into physical altercations. So he's sitting in class one day and he's sending text messages. And uh, school officials take his cell phone. Can the school officials read his text messages? Well, the answer to that is no. There was no indication that anything uh, in the cell phone that, that he was doing anything inappropriate in the cell phone. The, the, the thing is, he was just sending text messages. He was goofing around uh, with the phone. You, the teacher observed him having his phone out and using it when he's supposed to be paying attention in class, taking notes. Okay, so he could get dinged for that. But... That's not, the search is not justified at its inception. I mean, what's the basis for the search? Well, Joe's a, Joe, Joe's a pain, that's, that's my basis. Well, that's not, that's not a sufficient legal basis. In the real world, the practical world, perhaps it is, but not in the legal world. Um, so again, it has to be justified as of the scope. Now, what if, what if the teacher goes and gets Joe's home screen phone and the home screen is a sexually explicit photo of what appeared to be a minor? Would that change the answer? Absolutely. Absolutely, because now you have evidence that there's something inappropriate on that phone. And suddenly the offense, potential offense is not that the fact that the kid's not paying attention to the teacher is goofing around on his phone, but rather the offense is what's on that phone. Uh, so that would almost, most, most likely be deemed a reasonable basis to search uh, Joe's uh, messages, see if there's other such images, his photos. Okay, I, I, I know you're sick of, of, of hearing this yet. Justify it at its inception, reasonably related to scope. Um, schools that issue electronic devices for academic purposes, like it's Chromebooks, students have no reasonable right to privacy. They're owned by the school, not by the student. They're being loaned only for academic purposes. Such schools have far more ability to uh, greater latitude to search them. They're your equipment. You're just simply lending them to the students to use for academic purposes. Uh, so you would have a far more unfettered right to search those. Uh, district, just to cover itself, because you know, you know how attorneys can be, they should uh, have policy that explicit, explicitly state that such devices like these Chromebooks and stuff are not for personal use. 
So now it's a publicized policy of the board. Uh, cyber age, boy, I'm gonna pay the next. This is this is this is open such such a can of worms. Uh, as, as I noted before, the state law you can discipline kids, suspend and expel them for off-campus behavior, um, and that includes harassing or bullying statements that are created and posted totally off campus. They can still be susceptible to discipline if they cause a serious disruption of the educational process and if they're a violation of board policy. So if they're racist, if they're uh, threatening violence, if they're urging uh, mass disruption to the school day, walkouts, that sort of thing, and uh, if it's causing a serious disruption because it's being targeted to other students in the school and people in the school community, uh, it, it can be uh, subject to the district's suspension or expulsion the parents of the kid and the kid will claim it's their first amendment right to do it. Well, that's not always the case. Uh, we have a, a case involving Connecticut, Doninger versus Nyhoff, uh, 12 years ago, which is hard to believe, in which a student used a blog to, uh, you know, trying to whip up the community because she was unhappy with, with some, uh, some aspect of uh, what the district had done. Oh, they had canceled the annual jam fest. The, the, the ultimate, the ultimate offense. So, you know, she referred to the superintendent and the principal as douchebags. Uh, she said, if you wrote the contact, you contact the superintendent, it would piss her off. So all these people start calling the superintendent and principal to complain about their purported actions, uh, start calling them names, that sort of thing. Um, so the administration discovers that the student donager is behind it. And they say, fine, you cannot run for senior class secretary. So of course she files suit goes up to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, which sits in New York. And uh, they finally say, no, the district was right. They could discipline her. It foreseeably created a risk of substantial disruption within the school environment. So she was telling people, I mean, in this case, she was telling people, contact the school, contact the superintendent, you know, tell her, tell them what douchebags they are, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so the court said, the long arm of the school, as they say, off-campus contact of this sort can create a foreseeable risk of substantial disruption within the school. And, and so the fact that it happened off ca campus does not necessarily insulate the student from school discipline. Again, the long arm of the school, um, this is where, they, again, they were actively inviting people to contact the school and disrupt the school with calls and so forth. Uh, one of the famous free speech cases, school uh, can uh, discipline people, students, whether on school ground, well, particularly on school grounds for vulgar speech, lewd conduct. Um, schools can restrict what school journalism class and school newspapers are writing about, um, so long as there are legitimate pedagogical concerns. And that's the key, legitimate pedagogical concerns, you know, there are privacy considerations as well, FERPA concerns, that kind of thing. Um, and this bong is for Jesus, <laughs> which I always get such a kick out of. Uh, you know, the court said that, you know what, districts cannot be placed in a position of being seen to endorse speech that uh, promotes drug use. They have the right of, of uh, controlling the message, so to speak. That, um, and, and so therefore they were able to discipline these students for, um, for having engaged in this bond gets for Jesus uh, messaging. Okay, here's a couple of other cases, which. Mike, can I interrupt for just for a second? You got a lot of uh, interest in, in, in the search. Uh, um, issue. So okay. uh, someone had asked um, if, and this was with the cell phone, if, if you know the cell phone, you know, for example, I guess like the pornography one, can you, obviously you don't want to keep, a, make a copy, but can you hold on to the cell phone itself and not return it to the student knowing that that is on there? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think you have to make a decision. Uh, do you hold on to it? 
is not returned to the student, or do you turn it over, you know, you leave you for the expulsion hearing or what have you, although I don't know what you do with it in the expulsion hearing, because if you were to show the board members of the hearing officer what's on the phone, uh, you'd be creating a crime and the board members of the hearing officer who are reviewing the images would also be creating, uh, not creating, committing, committing a crime. Um, I think the best thing to do would be to turn over to the police. Now, you, but to the extent that the question is, well, what if parents come and say, hey, that's my kid's phone. I spent, I spent good money on that. Too bad. Um, we are confiscating it. And we, and that's why I would contact the police. Give it over to the police. Make it the police, the police uh, department's headache. Why are you assuming the headache? Let the police assume the headache. Uh, you have no obligation to give the phone back to the kid or the parents. All right. And the other one was about searching a backpack, looking for a recording device. And I guess the scenario was that you have reason to believe that the parent is asking the student to record classes or, or teachers, which is against school policy um, and can you search a backpack looking for a recording device? Ooh, that's interesting. Well, if it's, against, if it's against the publicized board policy to make unauthorized recordings in a school, in a classroom, then it is and, and there's reasonable the, a reasonable basis for believing the student is doing this, then it's this, such a search would be reasonable at its inception. And because you're only searching the backpack, because the backpack's in the classroom with the kid, as opposed to the locker, which is you know down the hall, or the car, which is out in the parking lot, the scope of the search is also reasonable. Uh, yeah, I think it would be, I think it'd be fine. Thank you. You're welcome. You know, I, I was thinking of an analogy about the, the prior question with respect to holding onto the phone. If people, and, and I could see, I could see where a, a administrator might be saying, you know, these phones are pretty expensive. The parents were really making us think about it. Um, but think of it this way. What if we're a gun? What if you found a gun in the, the, the kid's backpack the parent says, hey, that's a pretty expensive pistol. You know, I paid a lot of money for that. Um, I, I don't think you'd be saying, oh, okay, here, here's your gun back. Uh, you know, you'd be calling the police. And, and I think also that's, that's true with the phone as well. You know, once, again, I turn over the phone to the police because shift, shifting the headache, you've seen what's on it, that's sufficient evidence for an expulsion or disciplinary proceeding. Uh, you do not need to, uh, you can give to the police. And frankly, I had, I had an expulsion hearing once where I sat on the board where a police officer came and testified as to what was on the phone. Uh, a student had child pornography videos on his phone. As I said at the outset, I've done, I, I can't even count how many expulsion hearings I've been involved with in my years. I mean, no, oh God, you know, hundreds, hundreds, if not a thousand. I mean, just for a ton. Uh, and I can easily say that is the most hideous evidence I've ever heard in the hearing. It was, it was just it was appalling. It was awful. I've never shared the substance of it with anyone outside the hearing. Um, and the police officer he came and testified until we finally said, okay, we've heard enough. So if you're concerned about an evidentiary issue, you could always testify about what you saw, or you can ask the police to come in and testify about what they found. But I would give the phone to the police and then leave it to the police and the prosecutor to decide whether or not to return the phone. Um, so, and it might be, you know, frankly, it might be that, well, the images on the phone, the police might do a forensic search and say the images on the phone are inappropriate, but these people are not minors. They're, we've we somehow determined that they're not minors. So there's no crime per se here. And then, you know, they're, they're going to return the phone to the parent. You, you, I don't think school staff members have to be put themselves in the position of trying to decide whether some of the minor or not, uh, unless it's another student they recognize who they know to be a minor. But in any event, give it to the police, let them sort it out. Um, all right. 
threats of violence. You know, someone is sending out instant messages about, you know, a picture of a person firing a gun at his head and splattered blood and kill the teacher, uh, sending it out to people. Um, word gets to the school administration and the kid is suspended. They, and, the, and, you know, the parents who clearly have kind of an odd perspective on what's important and what's not, they see the school district. Court finds that the district was it was appropriate in excluding the kid um, because it would materially and substantially disrupt the work and discipline of the school. I mean, this kid is really uh, disseminating this this violent image and urging, even though he claimed it was a joke, that this teacher should should uh, be killed. However, you know, courts, different courts, different outcomes. Here's a kid who had a similar situation, claimed should kid should be teacher should be shot. Uh, posting with him made on his Facebook account that only his Facebook friends could view. Um, court said, yeah, there really was a substantial disruption of the educational process. Uh, no students missed class and no employees missed work. I don't agree with this, this decision. Um, the fact that it caused it, you know, the student, the teacher was had was very, very concerned and very frightened. I think, you know, there was an investigation I think the standard for what's substantial disruption is relatively low. Uh, this court clearly did not agree, uh, but they found that the kid could not be disciplined. Um, so, cyberbullying, um, people who are, you know, they're, they're bullying. There are state laws, as you know, against physical bullying, emotional bullying, uh, cyberbullying. Um, it's the fact that it's created off campus uh, and done outside the school day. The fact that it is identifying another student, it's involving another student. Remember the criteria for off campus misconduct are other students involved. Uh, that's one of them. And, you know, all these, look at two dozen students from the school posted comments on the site. So there clearly was this involvement of a student that caused a dis disruption. The one student was afraid to come to school. She's very upset. Um, the uh, all these other students were talking about it. It was causing a real ripple through the school. So the court appropriately um, held that this had enough of a disruption of the educational system that the district was correct in uh, disciplining the student. Okay, I'm running short on time here, so uh, let me figure that out. All right, just talking briefly about some COVID-related issues. Obviously, students and employees must always wear masks. Uh, there are some exemptions, students with disabilities who cannot safely or successfully wear a mask. Uh, with certain exceptions, and, and, and actually this, you know, applies to special ed kids as well. A student who refuses to wear a mask or who regularly removes it in an oppositional manner. Now, I, I add that in there, because let's say you have a kid who's you know, running late for class or something, literally running late for class and, you know, maybe out of shape and it's very winded, it's having a hard time breathing, might have to remove the mask for a moment just to catch his breath. Well, you know, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, but someone who's saying, eh, screw this, I'm not gonna wear a mask, this is un-American. Uh, my president tells me I shouldn't, I don't need to wear a mask, that sort of thing. Um, and removes it uh, can be subject to discipline. You can suspend, uh, or if the conduct is sufficiently egregious, such as it's repeated, someone is takes off their mask and sneezes in the face of another kid or a staff member, um, that student can be suspended or expelled. Uh, poses a threat. It's a seriously disruptive. Uh, it poses a threat to to other students. Uh, this is obviously a very deadly pandemic, and uh, districts have the right to do so. Uh, you have a student who refuses to comply with or knowingly violates quarantine mandates following interactions with individuals who have COVID-19 or, or who travel to states on the list of states which require quarantine or a negative COVID test, and they say, and they come back into school, and, and you know, you find out later that this kid has been you know, this kid's living in a house with people with COVID 
you know, they're coming into school and so forth rather than quarantining. Um, I mean, I think I think the better I, mean, I think the better approach would be to talk with the family and make sure the kid and say, okay, your child has to learn remotely or you know, the quarantine period, what have you, the appropriate quarantine period. But if you have parents to say, hey, I'm not home during the day, or no, that's not gonna work. My kid's coming to school, you can't keep them out. You can't suspend or expel that child. This is, again, a clear and present danger uh, to other students, to other staff members. So uh, masks are a requirement. And hopefully the district has, in, in a, in, and remember, you know, a lot of disciplinary policies also provide for expulsion. They're kind of catch-alls. I, I, it's a catch-all that I, I'm always happy to see for a violation of state or federal laws. The governor's executive orders constitute state law. So uh, if there's a violation of such, you know, quarantine requirements or what have you, um, you, you can't expel the student. And in any event, it, again, it's posing a threat to others. Now, you know, and most disabled students are fully capable of complying with mask mandates. Uh, if they can't do so to the severity of their disabilities, uh, as would be true with any other aspect of the student's educational program or placement, uh, the PPT or 504 team, depending on which the student is, a special ed kid or a 504 kid, should determine whether an exception is warranted. Um, and they should consider accommodations, alternative, programmatic and placement options. So maybe they say, well, uh, you know, the child should be learning remotely, but then if the kid is that involved, they might not really be able to access their education remotely as well as in, in, in person. This is a very, very, very limited number of students uh, whose impairments do not permit them to wear a mask, either due to health, dis physical disabilities or other disabilities that, that do not allow them the, the sensory aspects of wearing a mask, but that's pretty rare. Um, you cannot exclude a student from school due to his inability to wear a face covering. I mean, I talked before about remote instruction. You have to have the parents' permission for that, obviously. You can't just say, okay, the kid's gonna be remote. Because again, that would be deemed punishing the student for the disability. So it's a very difficult, tricky situation, but you have to make accommodations. That's why I talk about the PPT team, the 504 team, the school nurse should probably be involved in those meetings. Um, but if you have a student with a disability who is capable of wearing a mask and refuses to do so, you would treat it just like you would any other disciplinary incident for a special ed kid. You could suspend them, or if it was to the point where you felt you needed to expel them, well, you go through the manifestation process. But they are, they, again, the, it's a very low, little minority of students who could be expected not to be able to wear masks. Remote learning misconduct, you can um, discipline students for participating remotely. The fact that they have opted for that remote uh, instructional model, that's essentially they're in school. So it can be equated to in-school misconduct. They're actually located off campus in their homes perhaps, but that's their equivalent of being in school. So it can be equated to in-school misconduct. Um, the suspension, expulsion uh, can be held virtually. I mean, the suspension can be done by telephone uh, or virtually. I've done some virtual expulsion hearings already. Um, they're a little tricky as far as exhibits go, but they can be done. Um, and you know, again, as I said before, remote learning can serve as the alternative educational opportunity. It's, it's probably the, the low cost and most effective means of, of providing an alternative educational opportunity. If, however, the discipline arises from the abuse of the remote learning program, uh, the kid is Zoom bombing or he's acting inappropriately while on camera, that sort of thing, the district can provide a different form of alternative education. Maybe it's uh, getting packets of information with, with weekly check-ins with teachers or what have you. Not the greatest, you know, not the greatest alternative education, but um, if the student's, again, misconduct is disrupting the remote instruction, keeping that student as, as their consequence in that same remote instruction where he continues to disrupt, that, that's, that's not gonna work. Um, vaccines, 
Mike, before yes. you get on to that, this is kind of a question that goes in between those two. Uh, it says, if a student is positive for COVID and does not tell others, but has a party which results in a large number of other students being quarantined due to exposure, can that student, the first student, be disciplined by the school? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, this is not a disabling condition. This is a medical condition. Um, and if the student, not now, well, the couple of scenarios there. One, if the student knew he had, he or she had COVID and had a party anyway, that's really egregious misconduct. Um, uh, it involves other students. Does it involve violence or threats of violence? Eh, maybe not violence, but it is a danger. It's posing a danger to these other students because these students could themselves suffer severely adverse consequences, or they could go home to their parents and their grandparents and end up result infecting them and they die or are seriously ill. So absolutely a district can discipline those students. Now the other situation where a student doesn't know they have COVID, but nonetheless host a party that's uh, in excess of the amount of people that, you know, get indoor gatherings, that would also be a basis for discipline. Uh, the conduct is perhaps, I guess it's not as degree. It was not as egregious, but it's still egregious. I mean, you're still taking a ludicrous risk and, you know, parents are going to say, well, you know, the kids are really having a hard time dealing with this and it was misjudgment and they made a bad mistake. Well, you know, someone who brings drugs into school or bring a weapon into school, they make a bad mistake too, but you still expel them. Um, I have absolutely no question that you could expel those kids. Um, finally, vaccines. Uh, there, you know, the law appears to allow school districts to decline admission to, to a school building to a student who refuses to be vaccinated against COVID-19. I'm presuming these vaccines are at some point going to become widely available. You know, I'm probably, gonna, I'm probably I, I was kidding the other day, I'm probably going to get mine in 2023 or something, but um, presuming that the vaccines become available, again, there is uh, already laws in Connecticut that would suggest you could decline admission. I don't think you could expel a vendor expel them. I don't know if this is necessarily misconduct. It might just be a person's religious belief. It might be uh, some other good faith basis. But you know, quite frankly, you decline admission to the school building. It's you know, as someone I I, I used to know would say, it's the same difference. Um, you you get to the same result, but you're not putting a disciplinary mark upon that student's um, that student's record. Um, I think I think that's about it. Um, oh yeah, you know, one other thing I wanted to say, and I'm jumping way back, and I apologize. But I didn't want to turn this into too much of a special ed type of presentation. But one thing that some people are not aware of is that special education students have a lot of protections, like the manifestation determination. But there's one area in federal law which kind of blows my mind because the special ed students have, and I think by extension, 504 students would have would, would be covered under the same provisions. Um, they have fewer protections for certain sort of misconduct. If a student has a firearm, deadly weapon on school grounds, a special ed kid on school grounds or a school sponsored activity, the district can put the child out for 45 school days an alternative educational uh, placement without a hearing. And even if it is a manifestation of the student's disability. Furthermore, that same policy applies to a special ed student who has sold, distributed, or is even in just in possession of a controlled substance on school grounds or at a school activity. I'm going to come back to that in a second. The third criteria is a student who uh, inflicts serious bodily harm on another person. I mean, that has to be like, you know, give someone else a beating. It has to be pretty serious. But let's say they break someone's nose, theoretically, that would qualify uh, something along those lines. But so think of that. You've got a special ed kid who has marijuana on them on school grounds. A typical kid, you might suspend them. You might refer them to an expulsion hearing, but then you have to have a hearing before the board and so forth. 
special ed kid, you have a man, you're thinking, well, this is an expellable offense. You can suspend them for the 10 days. Then you have a manifestation of determination. Even if you find it's a manifestation, the PPT can put that student up for 45 school days. So between the suspension and the alternative educational pla uh, placement, that's 11 weeks of school days outside of school. It's really kind of mind blowing. Um, I, I think in a kind of an odd way, well, one thing that the federal government wanted to try to keep schools safe, but also I, the, I think they were thinking, well, if we do that, districts will be less likely to expel disabled kids because they'll think, well, we're gonna suspend them for two weeks and then put them in an alternative play, uh, program for 45 more school days. So that's something kind of to keep in mind. If you've got a situation where you're thinking, oh my God, you know, we got a we got a special ed kid who engaged in an expellable offense, but we got to have a manifestation termination meeting. We got to have the expulsion. Our time frames are conflicting, are clashing with one another. How are we going to fit it all in? One solution, if it's if it's again possession of a deadly weapon or firearm, or possession, distribution, or sale of a controlled substance, or again this infliction of serious bodily harm on someone else, the team can put the kid out for 45 days which gives you breathing, breathing room. Um, so that's something I just wanted to, to, to mention. I think that's about it. Yeah, Mike, you've done a terrific job of addressing questions and our audience has come up with some really good ones for you. There, there's one, one question that came up early on and I didn't have a chance to raise it and, and maybe it's, it's a simple one. Um, it says, what type of offense must the police notify the superintendent uh, uh, about are there certain offenses that the police maybe not on not have nothing to do with the school, but that police must let superintendents and districts know. Felonies. All felonies. All felonies. All felonies. Okay. All felonies. Yeah. Well, then we got that one. All right. Well, Mike, I I, I can't thank you enough for for being here uh, for uh, giving such a information rich. Uh, presentation that really covered so many relevant and timely topics. And, and I know the way the questions were coming in from administrators, uh, these are things that are really on their mind and they're, they're always eager to get uh, information about. So I really want to thank you for sharing your expertise and for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, I want to thank again CASA's corporate sponsors. Uh, the Connecticut Army National Guard, Liberty Bank, Horace Mann, Jostens, and especially uh, the law firm of Pullman and Cumley uh, for their support of professional development for Connecticut's school leaders. Thank you to everyone in the audience for attending today. Uh, I know this information will be valuable in supporting you and your important work uh, in the schools. We will have a recording of today's webinar uh, available in a couple of days. Uh, you'll receive a notification when it's ready. Uh, if you registered, you'll get an email that will uh, let you know uh, where you can uh, find the recording. I hope you'll attend future CAS webinars. Uh, please visit our webpage, cascic.org, for all the details of CAS events and activities that are coming up. And also check your weekly CAS News Blast uh, for information. So on behalf of all of us at CAS, uh, again, I thank you. I wish you well. Have a good day and a great week. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike.